Hello and welcome back to this year's series of podcasts of Democracy in Limelight. I'm Nancy Mukherjee, your motivator and host. Today's topic is uh, beyond disinformation, digital threats to democracies. Uh, I think in an age where technology meets every day of life, its exposure to cyber space, time or cybersecurity risks might be unavoidable. Thus, digital society requires more protection of the networks and devices that support democratic processes. And today I can discuss this very important issue with Lukas Kroll, a digital security trainer, a researcher with a particular interest in journalist security. In addition to working directly with journalists, he also researches digital security pedagogies and tool selection. And uh, Stefan Turkheimer, he was a lawyer who traded in suits, suits for policy in shorts. He has been a chief of staff for senators from his state, uh, was a deputy political director for Elizabeth Warren when she was running for president. He now works in government relations and partnerships for COVID Act now, a disease intelligence and modeling nonprofit. Um, if cybersecurity is not integrated into democratic cycle, the protection of democracy in cyber time will not be sustainable. My first question to maybe Lukas, so what are legal, technical or any other challenges uh, while securing democracy in cyberspace, cyber time, you can call it as uh, uh, the way you wish. Uh, what do you think? Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for inviting us. And I think that there's a reason why we kind of called today's episode beyond disinformation. And that's because disinformation, I think, is one of the biggest risks to democracies right now. But actually, disinformation happens as part of one huge and diverse ecosystem. So one of the very common disinformation tactics that's being used right now, for example, is something called a hack and leak. So, for example, the email inboxes of politicians get hacked, as has been happening in, in Poland recently. And this information is then leaked in order to affect democratic processes and democratic outcomes. So disinformation is probably the number one issue, but the way in which information for disinformation is obtained or the way in which disinformation spreads is much, much more complicated. It's kind of the same with disinformation on social media, right? It's not just that disinformation exists on social media. A huge issue with this is that the information spreads and disinformation spreads via very, very complex algorithms that have been pretty much designed to spread and promote, promote sensationalist news. So, I mean, it's very difficult to think what our responses and our policy toolbox should be, because there's so many different ones, right? I think that one of the first ones that I would definitely suggest is that political parties, for sure, and politicians need to think much, much more about the individual security, because I would say that one of the greatest cybersecurity slash disinformation risks was definitely the hack of John Podesta's personal email account, which tragically was very, very much preventable. It happened in the US a couple of years ago. The other thing that I think is really important is to actually have like a society-wide response. So in France, for example, prior to the last presidential election where Macron was competing against uh, Le Pen, there was actually a leak and a hack of documents in the very final days, maybe even hours of the election. And the media just refused to spread those documents and report on those documents. So essentially, like a whole, a whole response like this is very, very crucial to actually have the media on board and the citizens on board and for people to say, hey, we will not tolerate this disinformation and just to create a norm like this. And the final thing is that Cybersecurity threats are a really interesting thing because in most cases, it's not actually about the cybers. It's not actually about the digital attacks. Rather, the digital attack finds an existing deep split within society. It finds an existing social conflict. The conflict could be, for example, related to the rights of migrants. The conflict could be related to economic inequality or gender inequality. 
But in each one of those cases, this deep conflict and the fact that a certain site has already been radicalized by this conflict means that any sort of cyber type attack is particularly powerful. I'm more than happy to talk a bit about direct election security because I'm not at all a fan of electronic voting, but that's a much, much longer story because in almost every case, the actual attacks and the actual bad stuff that happens is not at all technologically sophisticated. In almost every case, it's a very simple hack. It's a very simple leak. It's a very simple exploitation of Facebook or Instagram algorithms. And in each case, this attack isn't successful because it's technologically fancy. Rather, it's successful because it has really found a sort of social division. And the solutions to this must be social rather than policy. And in most of those cases, like with the French media refusing to republish leaked data, the results must be a social consensus rather than purely legal. Because if it's a legal result, it feels like people are forced into it. You might get challenges in courts and the issues themselves will be debated much more. Whereby if it's some sort of like social discussion convention, you can resolve it much, much faster. And uh, Stefan, maybe your thoughts, uh, what you can add? Yeah, there's a couple couple things I think that are important. One of them, when you're talking simply about digital protection infrastructure, um, we think a lot about the politicians themselves. Like you're talking about email um, hacks and that sort of thing. There's also the election security um, uh, systems. What's really interesting about them is that they actually, we have elections, let's say every two years, for instance, but the life cycle of the physical equipment is actually much longer than that. And so we're talking about, you know, we're talking about attempts by um, outside actors who are trying to get into the system and they're, they're getting better every day, but the equipment itself isn't actually changing that, that frequently. And so it can't really keep up. That's just one small thing. The second thing I'd like to point out rather than the, the he's talking about the fissures in society that are exploited um, by people that are looking to undermine elections. There's also thinking about the people that are doing the exploiting. We tend to think about those people as being outside the system, as being, you know, foreign Mm -hmm. foreign actors, right? But a lot of times they're not foreign actors. A lot of times they're actually the people that are um, you that are the people that are responsible for um, coming up with the rules for the election, or actually the rule. um, carrying out the rules for the election. And so, you know, the most important thing in a democracy is that elected officials accept their own losses, right? So if you don't have a peaceful transition of power, then you don't really have a democracy. And if you have elected officials who are unwilling to lose, then they're actually the threats. The threat is coming from inside the house, right? And so you have to think about what are the rules you can put into place, no matter who's in office, no matter who's challenging, that are going to protect that election. And in order to have that happen, the people that are actually going to be elected have to find their better angels and let them sing. Um, You mentioned about um, that peaceful transition as the democracy, right? But uh, in other words, how to counter this increasing threat to the core of our democracy? It's a great question. It's really at the at the heart of so many of these overall discussions, right? And which is like, how do we protect the institutions? How do we believe in the things that we're actually saying, right? Um, and there's a number of ways that which you can do that. So how do you how do you protect the core? And jump in whenever you whenever you have anything here. Always. Yeah. I mean, please. Um, So let's think about like legal protections of the core, right? So if you have these standards of democracy, right, which is that the person with the most votes wins, let's just assume that that's our standard. Obviously, in a lot of countries, we don't actually use that. For instance, in the United States, we don't use that for our presidential elections, but let's just assume it is. If you can get people to adhere to that concept and force the concept, and I mean, I'm talking about people forcing politicians to adhere to that concept and put in rules to protect that concept, then you can have... The, the overall standard of thought be the standard of law. And so connecting those two things is incredibly important. And what happens is you have to put pressure on the electeds outside of their election sphere. So you can't ask them to protect the election two weeks before the vote. You have to ask them to protect it two years before the vote, before they think that they're going to lose. So that's the key to these things, which is to get the ideas that we talk about enshrined into law, to make those two things connect. And the way you do that is really through public pressure. For one thing that's, I think, worth adding in this dovetails really nicely into the cyber aspect is that a huge issue is that 
all of those dynamics have not been very understandable recently. And I think that both in terms of digital security and cybersecurity and in terms of democracy, one of the biggest things is that the system needs to be understandable. So one of the reasons why I'm very critical of electronic voting, for example, is because it's easy to explain paper voting and the way paper votes are counted and the way paper votes are secured to pretty much any voter. In order for someone to reasonably know how to secure electronic voting, you have to essentially have a PhD in higher mathematics or computer science. And maybe a master's is enough, but you know, a very advanced degree. And I think that it's something similar with a lot of the democratic institutions, that there needs to be a very wide and big understanding of why is it that we do the things that we do and how do things happen? So this can be from something like how does an election vote to what is the role of a constitutional court to something very, very different, even like how does this information work? Because I'm pretty sure that there's very, very little education right now happening outside of an NGO bubble that looks at the way, for example, this information spreads on Facebook. Essentially, people know that it spreads on Facebook. They don't fully understand its mechanisms. And I don't expect everybody to be an expert on the Facebook algorithm, especially because probably Facebook itself is not an expert on the Facebook algorithm either. But like having some sort of basic knowledge of how the actual civic infrastructure of our democracy works is very, very important. So I would say that, you know, both with cyber systems, with cyber break-ins, leaks, disinformation, and the current divisions in democracies, a lot of this just comes from the fact that things are not particularly understandable. And I think that, you know, any project that aims to further understandability or explainability it's going to be a very, very valuable one. Yeah, that's incredibly important. I hadn't even really thought about that. I mean, like the, the, the reason all of these things succeed, everything from disinformation to actually the threats of hacking an electoral system, all of those go to undermining faith in the system. And so whether the, the whether the electoral systems are actually hacked or whether they just the impression that they've been affected is actually just as effective, because what happens is, is people will only vote if they think their vote's going to count. If they stop thinking their vote's going to count, they just won't vote. And that's the ultimate way of undermining electoral system is by eroding the trust in it, because when that trust rides, then it's very easy for the electoral outcome to not match the people's will just by encouraging them to lose their own faith in the system. That's actually very quite um, interesting for me specifically because two episodes before I was moderating a discussion to promote electronic voting. And right now I'm hearing all the challenges, how to make it happen actually, but uh, how to overcome those threats as well. But I kind of have another question, which is uh, I would like to have the answer from both of you. Maybe you presented about the pressure from outside, maybe not two weeks before the elections, but two years before the elections. Who are responsible for that? Maybe citizens, NGOs, how to get out of this NGO bubble? Uh, who are those responsible for that? Or who are the main stakeholders here? I mean, I would say that a huge amount of the responsibility should just go onto politicians themselves, which is a very weird and unpopular answer, and I'm aware of that. But the reason why foreign disinformation almost always succeeds is because domestic disinformation or like domestic divisions are so deep. I think that the other thing that really needs to happen is that we need to take a deep look at when and how foreign disinformation is used, okay? So it's super convenient to have sometimes foreign disinformation or foreign actor, because every domestic politician can suddenly blame their failures or the lack of responsibility on something that's happened from the outside. Whereas the only reason why foreign actors have succeeded in elections have been because there's been a domestic failure to respect democratic norms. Yes, we should be doing investigations. Yes, we should be tracking foreign actors. But the much bigger question is, why have those foreign actors succeeded? And the answer is always 
the foreign actors have succeeded because the domestic actors have failed. I think that one of the, it is of course possible for a foreign actor to disrupt a society to a large degree. We saw cyber attacks on Georgia, we saw cyber attacks on Estonia, but none of those cyber attacks actually destroyed the democratic consensus within the country because none of those attacks were able to successfully exploit social divisions. Essentially, those, society, those attacks, I wouldn't be surprised if they actually left society more united than divided because there was a very clear common enemy. So I would say that the responsibility very much lies on understanding that foreign actors only succeed because of our internal divisions. And maybe declassifying more documents or even talking more openly about this would also go a long way. There have been like, even for example, in the UK, there was a de partially declassified paper which looked at foreign interference in elections. It was super interesting. It was barely talked about. So I think that this big conversation actually, what is the relationship between foreign actors and domestic divisions? Why are foreign actors succeeding and why are they succeeding only now is crucial. And politicians definitely, and to a large degree, the media should do this as well. Because like, it's been pretty difficult to find any good coverage of that UK intelligence hearing and that UK intelligence paper in any type of newspaper other than those which are read by pretentious Oxbridge graduates. That's a, I mean, that's, that's an, I have no, I have no qualms with that take. What I'd like to add is that transparency, which is essentially what he's talking about here, transparency in this whole system to allow people to know how this stuff is working is incredibly important to people having faith in their ability to change change an election, change the decision, whatever it is, change their politicians. Um, the secondary part after the politicians, though, is, and NGOs play a role here, obviously, is that you have to have the people believe entirely in the norm and believe that, they, that if they're living in a democracy, um, not only do they have a responsibility to vote, but that their vote will matter and their vote will count. And there's a lot of, there's education that has to go into that. There's transparency that has to go into that. But really what you have to have is you have to have a situation where you believe in the norm of voting and that your vote will count and that, and that various systems for counting votes are required. You have to believe in that more than when you see some different disinformation where you agree with the overall construct of it. Because what happens is, is that someone sends me some information as a voter that I agree with, right? Um, and then that becomes more important to me than the overall norm. So what we have to do is strengthen the norm so that, so that people value democracy as a concept more than who wins. And that can be tricky for people. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, overall, transparency, disinformation, elections, and uh, finally, democracy. These are the key points we were discussing with our guests today. And um, I will ask our uh, audience to leave uh, your feedback and insights on this topic by sharing our podcast and stay tuned with us for the next episodes as well. See you next time. The following series of podcasts are being conducted by Digital Communication Network in partnership with Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom.